Hello, my friend. Thank you for joining me today for, um, we were talking about before this recording about how we're going to try to recreate back when you, you lived in Ottawa, we used to take walks and just talk about everything and about business and companies and all that kind of stuff. So today we're going to try to recreate some of that. It's not an interview. It's a conversation about a couple of companies that you, you've covered in detail. Small disclaimer first. This is not investment advice, like this is a general thing about everything we say, but also like it's not because we talk about something that we're saying, oh, you should invest in this now, right? I think we're both the kind of investors that like to learn about interesting companies and then eventually they may become good investment opportunities, but it's better to learn about them in advance. But anyway, I just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining me today. No, thank you so much. Uh, I was, I think I was the first uh, guest to uh, appear twice on your podcast and then David Sandra kind of came out of nowhere and he made it to thrice, right? So I had to be here to make sure I'm at, at least at par with David. But given how so, prolific David Sandra is, I, I don't think I'll be able to keep up with him. <laughs> oh, it's a real horse race now. It's a, there's competition. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I, so the businesses, I guess everybody has seen the title of the podcast by now, but we're going to talk about Cloudflare and Datadog, right? And this is not going to be exhaustive. If people want all the detail, all the history, all the financials and all that stuff in the show notes, I'm going to link to your two excellent deep dives uh, and maybe to some other resources, but your deep dives are full of resources and links. So that's, they are good hubs too. It's so funny how things can change quickly, right? Because I think when we first started talking about these businesses mm -hmm. and when you put them on your own docket for deep dives, they were like trading at incredibly high multiples, but everybody loved them and the multiples kept going up, which means that people kept recalibrating their opinions of the, of the companies in like more positive lights, right? Oh, th this thing is worth 25. No, it's worth 30 times, it's worth 35. It's, it's like people kept loving them more basically. And now just a year later, all these stocks are down like 50, 60, 70, 80% yep. in some cases, and the multiples have compressed tremendously, right? That's not the performance of the revenue growth and all that stuff, the, the, the gross margins haven't fallen off a cliff, right? A lot of stuff has still kept going, but the stocks are trading kind of terribly, right? So funny how, how those things change, but anyway, that, <laughs> I guess that's part of the discussion today, but we, we want to mostly talk about the businesses, not the stocks. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's incredible how things can change within just, you know, 12 months. And you kind of have to live through it to be able to appreciate how much things can change within 12 months. There are probably a couple of things I want to say about this rapid change. I remember like having conversation about some of these companies even before I studied these companies. Like I was having some conversation with some of my friends uh, who also invest. And I remember one of my friends told me, that both these companies were probably trading at, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, 50 times revenue like a year ago. And if you think about it, when something trades at 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever, like in you know, a revenue multiple that these companies were trading at, the kind of shareholder base that you have is just, it's very different. Your shareholder base mostly consists of very valuation insensitive investors, mm, right. right? So one is basically, let's say, obviously there are passive investors who are like legally required to be valuation insensitive, right? That is their, uh, that is what they're trying to do. And similarly, investors who care about valuation, they probably get nervous even when something starts trading at like 20 times, 25 times. So by the time it crossed that 20, 25 times on revenue multiple, anyone who cares about valuation are probably already priced out. Like they are not there. So anyone right. who was left as shareholders Either like they have a very low cost basis, they just, so they just don't want to pay taxes, or passive you know investors, or just just people who you know are momentum traders, or people who are just think about this business can be so much bigger in like ten years, fifteen years. That you know, so if you think about it, if you, if you notice the kind of characteristics of all these types of shareholders that you may have when you are trading at like 40, 50 times revenue multiple, it does show that they are perhaps valuation insensitive. So it probably at some point it stopped mattering whether these companies are trading 40 times or 140 times. It's the same <laughs> thing. You know, you couldn't probably make the math work at 50 times revenue. We also couldn't make the math work at 70 times revenue multiple. So there, obviously there's a huge difference between 50 times and 70 times, but the kind of investors who are on that, 
uh, level, uh, they couldn't care less whether it's 50, 70, or 90. So that's one. Uh, and I think now that the stocks are kind of down at like 70, 80%, now it has definitely attracted tension from those kind of investors who care about valuation. Mm. And now they're kind of, you know, prodding along and like they are kind of, you know, uh, arguing about terminal economics, what it can happen, what may be eventually the margin structure look like. So all those things that I think, you know, many, many of the investors currently are talking about, the reason they were not talking about that is probably they just, you know, weren't there at all in these companies. Obviously, like, you know, we are all kind of drawing caricatures of the market, who really knows who those investors are, or what the current base of investors are. A lot of this is just, you know, driven by sentiments. Like, you know, when 10-year yields goes from close to 0% to 4%, like within 12 to, or 24 months, that's a massive change, right? And a lot a lot can change within, within that time frame when rates go from such low level to such, uh, like 4% itself is not a high number, but to go from 0.5% to 4% in like 12 to 18 months, that's a massive change. Yeah, it's not always the absolute number, it's the rate of change. And the big fall that we saw in these stocks was kind of set up by what you said, right? About if most of your shareholders are super insensitive to this stuff, what else do these shareholders own, right? And if all that stuff is going down at the yeah. same time elsewhere, they're probably going to be forced to sell there anyway, right? If people were full, full on, on crypto and AMC and <laughs> all these types of things, well, it's not like losses on the, the SaaS side was segregated and the rest of the portfolio was doing great at the time, right? And if people are so aggressive in that manner, are they also aggressive in other aspects of their investing? Are they mm -hmm. on margin? Uh, you know, you hear about people that were like buying crypto on credit cards, right? That's not that's not diamond hands that can withstand big volatility, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm you not... can have that diamond hands, but the world will not <laughs> lift you to have diamond hands if you are buying crypto or like anything that's very volatile on with your credit card. Like the world will not let you have diamond hands. It's not possible. Yeah. The bank is going to come and repossess <laughs> your diamond hands. Yeah, right. You know, the one thing I, sorry, I, I would like to kind of mention here, I want to applaud the fact that even that we are having this podcast, even having this episode. I remember like, you know, 12 months ago, I saw a lot of people who claim to have deep interest in, in internet infrastructure and like what's going on in the cloud infrastructure. And like 12 months in, in, you know, later, I feel like a lot of that was just basically the stock price was going up and people are not as interested in, in this kind of geeky, nerdy topics, like what's going on mm -hmm. our in internet infrastructure or cloud infrastructure level or security level. And the fact that we are still having this conversation, like you are interested in having this conversation kind of shows me that you were always deeply interested in, in this kind of nerdy, geeky stuff. These are like a, my, one of my big takeaways from studying these companies. And I would also include CrowdStrike, which I covered like in, I think, mid-2021. These are important companies. These are companies worth studying and following. Uh, these are also interesting companies, regardless of what happens to their stock price, right? Yep. Uh, they may not be good businesses or they may, may be terrific businesses. That's kind of TBD, right? But I thought that was interesting. I, I thought all these businesses are very interesting. I didn't know a lot about these companies or a lot of how you know internet infrastructure or cloud infrastructure kind of is evolving or has evolved over the course of the last five, 10 years before studying this company. So I, I, I really enjoyed studying these companies. And like I said, I applaud uh, your continued interest, continued eagerness to learn about this uh, stuff. And I, I think you were one of the people who kind of persuaded me, like not directly, but indirectly, as I was kind of reading your newsletter. I was following like some of these companies like, that you wrote, wrote about, like especially Cloudflare. And I was like, ah, I probably want to understand what this business is. Like I, I see you writing about it. I don't quite understand all the stuff that you write about uh, on Cloudflare before starting this. And maybe even still, I don't quite understand everything that I that goes on in Cloudflare. But yeah, after studying this, my, my conclusion was these are very interesting companies uh, you know, and worth spending time on. Even if I don't buy the stock or whatever, like, you know, it's just, you know, stuff worth learning and, uh, and it's much more enjoyable just focus on learning. I'm pretty sure making money is also super important for anyone, including me, right? I'm not avoiding that responsibility and just, you know, trying to uh, use learning as an excuse. Uh, to to lose money, but yeah, like you know, over the course of like you know long period, I feel like both are important. You have to enjoy learning, and you also have to make sure you are making money if you want to survive in this world of investing. Yeah, no, you make a great point. It's like 
it's like in crypto, right? When the prices were going up, everybody was so interested in, in cryptography, right? And oh, the, there's a <laughs> private key here and a public key there. And, and then when it starts going down, suddenly like people don't care about that. So same for internet infrastructure. You, you find out who the real nerds were. And in my case, like I got interested in these companies because of the tech angle and only kind of like looked at them as, as stocks afterwards. Yeah. Um, so it's like when I write about stuff, Many of my biggest investments are boring, right? I never write about them, even though they may be my biggest positions because nothing is going on. <laughs> and these types of companies I write about all the time, not because they're investments or they're big investment or whatever, but because they are so interesting. There's always yeah. stuff going on, right? Like Cloudflare has a development velocity that is hard to match by anyone, including much, much bigger companies with multiples of the number of employees, right? Yeah. So it's ridiculous how much stuff they come up with in a year. Like it's Im <laughs> almost impossible to keep up with, right? We're not, yeah. we're not even going to try to cover everything today. So yeah, to me, there's a big difference between like what's interesting and then what you invest in. But I find that for my wiring, for my personality, I much prefer to start with what's interesting first because that gives me the fuel to learn about it deeply enough that if it ever becomes a good opportunity, I'm going to be able to recognize it and then have the ability to hold on for the long term, even if it's volatile, right? Because mm. if you buy something quickly just because the price was going up, you have no confidence in it and you have no understanding, right? So it may be a great five-year investment or 10-year investment, but if every time there's a bump in the road, you sell it, you're never going to get to that five or 10-year. Yeah. Uh, not saying it's any of these companies are going to be great five or 10-year investments. I don't know that, but yeah. Regardless, they're still worth talking about. So that's what we're going to try to do today. Uh, I want to start with a, a quick overview of Cloudflare because I think they may sound like something, oh, everybody knows them by now, but I think most people have kind of no idea what they're doing, right? They, their reverse proxy and their infrastructure is touching something like, at this point, I haven't seen the latest number, but probably like 25% of internet yes. websites. That's huge, right? The internet is really, really big, right? Yeah. But most people have kind of no idea how that stuff works. So the, the kind of short overview I would give is that Cloudflare started as a, a content delivery network. That's a CDN. Yeah. So that stuff is like, if you have a server with a bunch of files on it, and all of a sudden, a lot, lots of users are trying to access the same files at the same time. It could overwhelm the server, right? Mm -hmm. you, you could have terrible performance or even like not be reachable by your users. So what you do is you put someone in front of your server, someone like Cloudflare or Akamai or some of these other companies that do the same kind of thing, like the big hyperscalers also do it, like Amazon. And you put someone in front of your server and they get the file from your server and they they cache them into their own infrastructure, which is much, much bigger than your server. So when there's a flood of users, something goes viral or whatever, there's a huge spike on Christmas Day or whatever it is, your, your server survives, right? So that's what they've, they were doing for a long time. And as they grew, they had enough infrastructure to handle very massive traffic. So then they went into DDoS protection. DDoS is distributed denial of service attack. So that's a way that nefarious actors can try to take your site down, right? So they take control over thousands or millions of computers via viruses or hacking or whatever. And then they flood your server with traffic coming from all over the world. And like you can't block it all. You can't find the source, right? It's not one source that you can block. It's distributed. So they used to take down website. It could be a bunch of script kiddies, right? Doing that yeah. just for fun. It could be like blackmail. Some like Russian mafia type of black hat hackers would tell you like, you pay us this much or we're going to take your server down on uh, Valentine's Day when you make half of your sales, right? Or something like that. So Cloudflare, what they would do is similar to CDN. They would put their servers in front of you and they would kind of act like the big bodyguard with a, a Kevlar vest and they would jump in front of the bullet, right? And catch the bullet yeah. for you. So they would catch the attack for you and, and you'd survive. And because they have this huge distributed network, they could better find the sources of traffic and block it more easily. Yeah, I think one particular thing uh, that kind of, you know, stood out to me when I was studying Cloudflare, like how they kind of approached this problem. Like how come this small startup out of nowhere were able to build such a distributed large network all over the world? Like they, so, so I think that was quite, that, I found that quite unique. So they partnered with all the ISPs all over the world, like more than 100 cities around the world to have like co-location facilities on these ISPs. And it was kind of a win-win relationship for both the ISPs and Cloudflare. So ISPs, by allowing Cloudflare to have their servers on their facilities, you know, it could lower their bandwidth costs and, and you know, like Cloudflare could also help them uh, from DDoS attacks and all that. So once Cloudflare had their servers on those 
core, you know, ISPs and facilities, they kind of have their CDN business or the core product. And on top of that, like the, because these servers are kind of programmable, they could build a lot of the stuff on top of it. So it's just in the same yeah. base layer of infrastructure, and they're just you know building on top of it at a rapid pace, as you were saying, that it is so hard to keep up like what exactly they are building on their platform. So they had their you know, DDoS attacks, they see security products, and a lot of other applications. And now they are also talking about workers platform, which I'm pretty sure uh, you will touch on. What people look at Cloudflare today, uh, I think very few people are very super excited about the CDN business, right? They're much more excited about all the stuff that Cloudflare can build and probably will build and has been building on top of that base layer of platform that they have on these different ISPs around the world on a distributed basis. And I thought that was very unique. Like, you know, I, I mentioned uh, this kind of anecdote on my deep dive, like Matthew Prince and Michelle Zatley in the two of the three co-founders, other being Lee Holloway. Uh, so these, you know, Michelle and uh, Matthew Prince were meeting one of the advisors, one of their kind of advisors, and when they kind of explained what they're trying to do to solve the problems in the uh, infrastructure level, the advisor was like, oh, you're trying to build a CDN. And <laughs> I remember they didn't that. know what CDN is, so they kind of were nervous about it, and they kind of nodded along, yes. Like, you know, very nervously said yes. And then, like, after the meeting was over, Michelle and like, Matthew kind of looked at each other like, hey, what is CDN? And they had no <laughs> idea. You know, and, and, like, Michelle is from Canada. And she was like, maybe it has something to do with Canada, right? <laughs> so the fact that these people, like, didn't, have, didn't even know what CDN was, I think mm-hmm. in, in, in retrospect was probably helpful uh, to kind of approach this problem, you know, from a very unique vantage point. First principle, right? First principles perspective rather than, oh, we already have this. Let's just kind of make it incrementally better. No, because they didn't know any of that stuff in the initial years, they kind of approached it in a very, like you said, first principle basis and approached this problem in a very different way. In a way, only probably, you know, startups could come up and disrupt the incumbents. If they were trying to do something what Akamai was already doing, I don't think we would be talking about Cloudflare today. Yeah, for sure. If you just copy what someone else is doing, like in Cloudflare's case, you would have a very, very different infrastructure and it wouldn't be flexible in the way that allowed them to level up with all the other stuff, right? I think you said it very well, like the CDN stuff was the Trojan horse that got them in the door, right? Because Mm -hmm. from an ISP's perspective, if every commercial customer, every uh, just private citizen connected to you is going all day long and surfing the web. And every time they're going somewhere that you have to connect to the outside internet and go somewhere and go back, like that's all bandwidth costs, right? Connection costs. If you have Cloudflare that is caching like thousands and thousands and thousands of websites inside of your co-location, the traffic just doesn't even go out, right? It's free, basically. That's what like Netflix and Google, they all put a bunch of racks inside of ISPs. And when you're watching Netflix, you're not going out on the open internet on the server to try to watch your movie, right? It's all inside of your ISP. And Cloudflare kind of did that, but instead of just for one company stuff, right? For Netflix, it only its movies. Well, they're doing it for everybody that they're doing caching for, right? But once you're inside, you have very, very low latency, right? You're inside literally of the ISP. You have very low bandwidth costs. And then the way Cloudflare designed its network is they use like commodity hardware everywhere. They didn't build custom like special server for CDNs that were super specialized and could only do like this kind of storage and bandwidth. They built servers that had a bunch of other resources that then over time they use for other things. On calls, they often talk about how when they decide to build a new product, they will often look at what's our idle capacity right now, right? What do we Mm -hmm. have an extra or even if it's not literal capacity, right? Because you don't overbuy that much, but it's kind of latent capacity, right? Well, well, we could easily add that part without rebuilding the whole thing. And so, for example, first the CDN stuff was using a lot of like bandwidth, but outflows and storage, but then the security and zero trust stuff that they built later was more like compute intensive, right? With zero trust, like every connection has to be encrypted separately and you have to authenticate people all the time. Like the zero trust basically is a, a security model that assumes that everybody is denied everything all the time 
until they can prove that they have access to something. The old model was kind of like the castle and moating where you have a firewall and a VPN and like people outside can't access stuff and then you pass the gate with your credentials. But once you're inside of the castle, you can do basically yeah. anything, right? And that model mm -hmm. doesn't work anymore. People are distributed. People bring laptops home and hackers are much better getting inside it. So if they can get inside, they move laterally and they can you know, screw up your whole business. So now the new model is basically, okay, everything's going to be encrypted. Everybody's going to need authentication for every single thing they do, like every server, every service, every file, every app. Cloudflare got into that. And that's kind of like the way to describe it is that they're stacking S-curves, right? So, so the CDN stuff in DDoS was the first S-curve, but that S-curve is kind of plateauing out. It's pretty mature. On top of that, the second thing is the security stuff. And that one is still kind of early. And that one is bigger than the CDN stuff. It's a bigger market. It's a bigger TAM. If we can sure. still use the word yeah. TAM in 2022, yeah. maybe TAM has been banned or canceled. <laughs> I don't know. So that's the second one. But they are already working on the next one, right? The third one is the worker stuff. So they, they were looking at their, now they have like 275 locations around the world full of servers. And those servers, like, they still have a bunch of resources. And so they figure out that rather than be kind of dumb servers just serving like HTTP requests as a CDN, well, what if you could do a bunch of compute on the server, basically an edge platform, right? Instead of having to go back to the central server to do the logic of your an application or a service, if you could do that logic on the edge, mm. right? It would be faster for some stuff that's very latency dependent, but also, and that's kind of like the big use case that they discovered, in this world of like regulations and every country in the EU has different data laws and privacy laws and that stuff keeps increasing. Well, if you can process the data locally and follow the local laws and regulations and all that, that's a huge value add. But the big hyperscalers, their whole thing is scale, right? They try to be centralized. They try to have like a big DC for the, the whole region and they're not kind of fully set up. They can do some of it, but they're not fully set up to have like 35 different jurisdictions. And now yeah. maybe like, is every Canadian province going to do something different, every US state? And so Cloudflare with the third uh, S-curve that they're trying to do is the, the workers platform. And in theory, that's even bigger than the security stuff because mm -hmm. they keep adding stuff to it, right? They have a database with D1, they have uh, object storage, and they have all kinds of stuff where over time, it's kind of like becoming not fully equivalent, but reproducing a lot of the big central clouds, but at yeah. the edge. They even have a partnership with NVIDIA. They put a bunch of GPUs in there. That's the, the third one. And the fourth one, which is on the horizon, they've only talked about it a bit and they started doing it. It's kind of like becoming more of a global telco, right? If you look at what the IT spend of companies, like 50% is telco stuff, right? Just connectivity and all kinds of products there. So they have clouds there for offices where they basically bring a connection directly to your office. <laughs> and instead of yeah. connecting to an ISP, you connect directly into Cloudflare. So they keep adding stuff on top of each other uh, to kind of build that a meta S curve or something like that. Yeah, no, I think you summed it up so well. No, I think, you know, they are definitely trying to stack one S curve on another. That's what literally they're aiming for. I think two things that kind of I want to highlight is the region specific regulation uh, or the different laws in different jurisdictions that you kind of hinted at. So I remember reading interviews of uh, AWS executive, Google. Cloud CEO Thomas Kurian's interview and like Microsoft President Brad Smith and Matthew Prince's uh, interview. All of these people are interviewed by Ben Thompson over the course of like last 12 or 18 months. And Ben Thompson later highlighted this point. He kind of asked a similar type of question on like, hey, can you follow different regulations in different jurisdictions if they make you to? And everyone except Cloudflare was like, yeah, I know that's hard. Like, you know, it's going to be complicated. It's, it's, it's super hard. I don't know, you know, whether we'll be able to match these different regulations for different jurisdictions. It's going to be super complicated if they make us do that. And Cloudflare is like, no, 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 we, we can do that. And I think that's where the internet is heading. And it does seem there is a, there's definitely a grain of truth to that. Like China is already a separate sort of internet that, you know, yeah. structure, infrastructure that they have. And more and more, it's possible that we may not have like a global global source of value culture. It may have very different values in, in many different countries and regions. And if that happens, then yes, like Cloudflare seems to be in a better spot to go along with that sort of like changed reality in the internet infrastructure level. So that obviously that's something that won't show up in the next quarter's you know, revenue mm -hmm. or like uh, next year's revenue. It's definitely something that caught my attention. Uh, it's definitely possible uh, that Cloudflare may be potentially an unintended beneficiary of such regulations. 
and laws by different jurisdictions. And another thing is like you mentioned, the workers platform. The companies who are already in cloud or like let's say bigger enterprises who are thinking about shifting to cloud, it's unlikely that they will start with a workers platform because it's obviously not fully fledged and you know, they don't have everything that's that AWS or Azure has. It, yep. Those are much more developed platforms. A lot more developers are working on it. A lot of innovation is happening in those public cloud level. But if you know more of like you know new and up, up and coming startups, you know they are the ones probably who may think about building on top of a uh, workers platform. And I think uh, Matthew Prince mentioned this, like they studied like a lot of different developer platforms and it usually takes like eight to 10 years to catalyze innovation, to kind of, you know, spin the wheel yep. faster. And get the tools mature too. Yes, yes. And I think it's been what, five years uh, since they launched. So, so yeah, we'll probably have much better clarity probably in three to five years down the line what exactly is the potential for this platform. I think, yeah, if I remember correctly, 15% of their customers are building on top of workers platform. It's probably a bit dated because I, I looked at Cloudflare a few months ago. So probably, I don't know what's the latest number is in the, by, you know, in the latest quarter, maybe it's a bit higher. So yeah, it's a 15, 20% of their customers are building on top of workers platform. And if they can get this number to like, you know, 50, 60, 70%, and as they kind of, you know, platform, like the number of customers gets bigger and bigger, that can be something quite, I feel like those are the kind of stuff, you know, like what is the potential for workers platform, how big it can be. Those seem to be harder to model. Yeah, right? they kind of don't even try, right? They often talk yeah. about like their TAM and they're like, and we don't even try to give you a number for workers and then they say something like because the numbers get so ridiculous that you wouldn't believe us anyway <laughs> or yeah, something yeah. like that but yeah. i kind of like the long-term thinking on workers when they talk about it it's always like we don't try to like squeeze the lemon right now right we don't try to get money from it right now because all that matters is adoption from mm -hmm. developers right and yeah. so they announced like a fund with vcs they were trying to raise a one billion dollar fund from vcs to finance startups building on workers, which is kind of great, right? Because they're leveraging other people's money to help build up their own platform, right? So if yeah. you can do it, that's a good position nice. to be in. But then yeah. the fund was oversubscribed. It was like 1.25 billion. Okay, great. And then like a month later, it's like, oh yeah, the fund is now $2 billion with 40 VCs. It's like, well, if Cloudflare can have access to $2 billion of VC money to spend on the, the workers platform to help train engineers to know all of the tools, because that's the thing with engineers, right? If, well, if they have a choice, sometimes they don't, but if they have a choice, choice and you give them a tool and they learn it and they like it, they could stick to it for, for a long time, right? They move company and they try to use their favorite tools at the new company. And that's kind of like how AWS started at first, right? It was more of a, a startup thing. And over time, a bunch of these startups became the huge companies of today. And I think that's kind of like Cloudflare is trying to see this platform with that kind of energy, right? Okay, over time, we're trying to become respectable and attract the big companies, but also we want a bunch of like planting a bunch of seeds, like let, let a thousand flowers bloom in there and see what happens and maybe the next Uber or Airbnb or something is going to build on the workers. What do you think is the likelihood that some of these more, let's say, successful startups who end up becoming a lot bigger over time may graduate to, let's say, more established public cloud? Like if it's so easier to kind of move from, like one of the things that, you know, Matthew Prince talks about, like AWS has this egress because it's so hard to take the data out. And if, you know, Cloudflare makes it easy and keeps it as easy as it is to move in and out, can't some of these bigger customers just graduate to, let's say, AWS or Azure? Because these public cloud companies, like they are obviously, you know, investing hand over fist on these platforms. Yep. Yeah, so it's hard for me to believe that companies like Cloudflare will be able to match uh, the level of innovation that we will see on the public cloud level, like the top three that we have: AWS, Azure, and, and GCP. Do you think that that's a potential roadblock for? Cloudflare's workers platform to be successful. And and before you answer, I want to make sure that anyone who's listening to this podcast knows that before this recording, like I, I want I want to take I actually explicitly mentioned that I want to have this conversation. So it's not going to be like, you know, I'll do most of the talking. It, it, like it, because it's a conversation, we don't know who is going to do more of the talking. It could very well be Liberty doing 60% of the talking. So <laughs> yeah. But I'm really interested. Like I'm here to talk about these companies because I'm actually interested in hearing also Liberty's view. So I'm not just in expressing my opinions and views, which I can do from time to time, but I'm also very much interested in listening to what Liberty thinks. 
Thank you for mentioning that. I'll mention it in the show notes too, just so people know going in. It's a conversation about these companies. It's right. not an interview of NBI about these companies. Uh, it's a really good question. I think that's a huge challenge for them. I think if all else is equal, it's harder for Cloudflare because it's not as mature, right? So uh, if mm. all else is equal, I think a lot of companies building on workers will do it because not all else is equal. They're going to take advantage of some of workers' specific advantages, right? So, for example, the way it's much more decentralized and distributed at the edge, uh, maybe some applications need that to perform best, right? So moving back to a more centralized cloud may be kind of a step back. Maybe it's going to be the regulation stuff we were talking about, right, where you need kind of the logic that's present in, in each jurisdiction to do the app or the service properly. Cloudflare also seems to have a very, very efficient... Uh, network partly probably because it's co-located inside ISPs and all that so that's why they have like free egress on uh, R2 their storage like that's S3 compatible right they're trying to compete with Amazon the dynamic they're going for is like okay we're offering you something similar to S3 but without egress costs right because a, a bunch of people have huge egress costs on AWS and the way Matthew Prince said it is like either we win some customers because you know, we're offering something cheaper or we push Amazon to lower its egress costs, which will make our network more valuable. If mm -hmm. the egress costs are lower, all else equal, you're probably going to have more egress, right? You're, you're going to distribute your, your apps more. Maybe part is inside AWS, part is inside Cloudflare. Maybe a part is uh, on-premise, but you use the yeah. Cloudflare network to connect everything, right? Because one thing they often say at Cloudflare is like the network is the product, basically. So they're not trying to be so much like a competition to the centralized DCs that the hyperscalers have. They're trying to be a glue that ties everything together, like the open internet and the hyperscalers and, and like every office with its own secured private network. And so, so the glue becomes more valuable if you push the centralized player to not hang on to their data quite as much, right? Because that's what egress fees are. Like every time you send something out of the AWS via S3, you pay something. So it's encouraging you to keep everything inside, right? Yeah, but w w what is... Uh, the public cloud's incentives to kind of play along in Cloudflare's terms, like switching costs or lock-in, uh, I think is one of the key reasons why investors love this in a public yeah. cloud companies, right? So the moment it kind of is like very convenient and easy to kind of move from one you know cloud to another, will definitely diminish the switching cost and it can become like a pricing war down to the you know uh, bottom. So. And I'm pretty sure this is not a very like you know unique take. Like, I'm, public clouds probably know this, and that's why. And uh, they probably focus on building their platforms in a way they have you know built. So yeah. So like, uh, what do you think the incentives are for uh, AWS to kind of play along uh, with, let's say, Cloudflare's terms? So far, they seem to have kind of taken the middle road, where they they reduce their egress fees, but not fully, because. Mm -hmm. AWS is so big that they're looking at Cloudflare as like, oh, it's a billion dollar total revenue company. But like if yeah. you disaggregate the parts, right, the part that they're fighting for is much smaller. AWS is not going to lose two billion to win a hundred million there, right? So mm -hmm. in a way, that's kind of what Cloudflare is probably hoping. For a long time, they're going to be able to build stuff kind of from the bottom, right? Trying to disrupt things by building cheaper products. Uh, by using all this success capacity that they have on their network that was built for kind of something else. Right. And by the time they become big enough to be noticeable by the huge players well they're already big enough they already have the scale to be a real competitor i think that's kind of what they're hoping to do like classic uh, low-end disruption that's also why cloudflare has a huge free tier they have like probably around five million free users that's insane right that no, nobody else is like yeah we're giving away really good versions of our services the free tier is not just a trial, right? It's not like, oh, try it for 10 minutes and then you have to pay us. Like, I'm on the free tier of Cloudflare for some stuff, right? I'm, I'm on Warp Plus and a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, it's very uh, synergistic. Can I even say that word? Is, that, is it like TAM? Is, is it a bit banned? But anyway, I feel like <laughs> the free tier of Cloudflare is brilliant because the way the R&D works at Cloudflare is they create a bunch of products that are you know, the minimum viable product. And then they put it all to the free tier. And free people are just glad to have something, right? If you were right. putting the minimum viable product to a, a paid enterprise customer that's paying you like $100,000 a month or something, things may not be great. But if you kind of uh, use your free tier as a 
a bunch of beta testers, you're gonna get much, much more feedback that you could get with a QA team internally. You're gonna be able to iterate on the product much faster, make it better much faster. And then once it's great, after a shorter period than otherwise, then you can put it out to the paid tiers. And, and the mm. paid customers are just happier, right? With more solid product. I think that's how Cloudflare could do what it did so quickly. Like two years ago, they basically had almost no security products right? All the zero trust stuff didn't exist. And now they have like built a, a Z scaler inside of Cloudflare within a couple of years. They're already selling a bunch of stuff to the US federal government and they're not even FedRAMP approved yet, right? They're really, really fast at that stuff. And another reason why they're so fast, I think, is that they're dog fooding their stuff. So that, that's an mm -hmm. uh, expression that not everybody may be familiar, but uh, like eating your own dog food uh, is the expression of the news in tech, wh where it's like, if you use your own products, yeah. you're going to be much better at figuring out like what's wrong with them, or how they could be improved, right? Once in a while, we I'm sure we've all bought something and it, it really sucks and you're like, did the person that made it even try it? Right. You try for five seconds and you figure out all the problems. Well, Cloudflare... Almost all of their products now, like the Zero Trust stuff, is built on the workers' platform. So they're building their own products on their own platform. That helps them build the products faster, but also helps build the platform faster. Workers is improving faster because it's, it's used in-house, right? The engineer that's working on the Zero Trust thing can turn around and tell the workers, engineers, hey, this thing, you could make it better this way or that way. And so this kind of tight feedback loop, right? John Boyd would say the OODA loop of Cloudflare is very, very tight and very quick. And part of that is building on your own platform. Part of that is the free tier. Part of that is that the CDN stuff, right? The network is also kind of a sensor network. It's not only sending traffics and bits and pipes. They can also monitor the whole internet in a way that few companies can. They can route around damage and traffics and clog parts, and they can see from where the mm -hmm. attacks are coming so that the security stuff can be trained, right? Their machine learning models and everything, a bit like CrowdStrike, can be trained with a bunch of the data that they get from having millions and millions of users on their network connected at all time. So I feel like that's part of what makes Cloudflare so interesting. It's like, it's like a super organism, right? As a company, if you look at the whole network, it's a very, very complex thing with lots of interlocking parts that are very well designed to go together and to, uh, is flywheel another band word? I don't know, but it's like it, it, everything improves everything else. And that's this elegance that I like. It's probably why I write so much about the company. It's like, the more I learn about it, the more I'm like, huh, that's clever. It's like, for another quick example, the commodity hardware that they use everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Every server that Cloudflare has can run every Cloudflare product, right? So they can dynamically adjust things and they're like, okay, we need more worker stuff right now so we can take a bunch of servers that used to do CDN, but now CDN has less demand in this area. Uh, they cross compile their code, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it, so it can run on ARM and on x86, right? So they can buy the cheapest servers from either ISA, they're very, very flexible. And like the free tier for most companies that didn't design stuff from the ground up to be this flexible, if you were giving away your products to millions of people, it would be hugely expensive. But yeah. Cloudflare's gross margins are great. Their CapEx spending is not crazy, partly because the free tier is they give it to the idle capacity of the rest of the network. So the paid user get priority, right? So if you're a paid user, you're never going to be slowed down by the, the free users. And they send the free users to like uh, South Korea is asleep right now. Let's send free users to the DC somewhere in South Korea, right? Or let's use idle capacity in, in, in this uh, location that, I don't know, for some reason right now, some idle capacity. So they can move stuff around the network. So imagine the code that is like uh, the old telephone system switches, right? You have to route all of the things all around. Like they're routing stuff between data centers and between products all the time in real time while taking account of traffic on the internet and congestion and this fiber optic cable was cut. So we like, that's really like a big brain overlaid over the internet. Absolutely. And I think one thing that kind of uh, probably should be highlighted even more, the fact that they chose this off-the-shelf commoditized hardware uh, is definitely a key factor for their subsequent success or like subsequent products that they have built over on top of their products. Like you said, you know, they can just you know move the stuff from one one geography to another, one region to another, based on where the idle capacity is. It would be a lot harder if it were like more custom made and like differentiated servers and different platforms. Then you know it would probably be not as efficient and not as convenient to kind of you know move traffic from uh, one region to another or one server to another. Uh, but the fact that they have chosen to build based on like an off-the-shelf commoditized hardware made it possible uh, of all the stuff they're doing right now. And it does show long-term thinking, right? Because at the yes. time they made that decision. They didn't know all these details, right? Yeah, but when they were just a CDN, for example, or just doing DDoS protection, 
maybe they could have tweaked their DCs to be even more efficient at doing CDN stuff, right? But that would have precluded some other paths that they took later for like, I don't know, R2 and workers. And so this kind of long-term thinking that we're hearing now for workers, I'm sure it was, it was present five years ago. It was present 10 years yeah. ago, right? They, they, mm -hmm. It seems to be part of the DNA of the company, which is a good sign for the future. It's not just something that they stumbled into and like, oh, what an accident. We have this stuff that we can use for something else. It was, as you said, they probably didn't know what exactly they would do with it, but they knew that they had the capacity to invent something. They often talk about how they do these innovation weeks and these release weeks like eight times a year or something like that, where like in a week they release like 36 feature features and they write long blog posts about everything, all details. And tons of people are like, that's a bit overkill, right? That's a bit like, what kind of marketing is that? But when you listen to the founders talk about it, they're like, the target audience is engineers who want yes. to work for Cloudflare. And for the best engineers in the world, they can go work almost anywhere. So we want to show them that we're working on interesting problems that affect millions and millions of people. It's the foundation on the internet where everything else is built on top of us, basically. And they also want to show them that we can ship stuff. We're not mired in bureaucracy and like you're going to be in committees and meetings forever before you ship a tiny feature. It's like, no, no, no. If you come more for Cloudflare, like look at us, right? We're shipping stuff like every other day, right? So I think as marketing, that works pretty well. I remember like... Almost two years ago in, in a call, um, Matthew Prince said that they, I think in 2020, they had 200,000 applications for engineers and salespeople to work at Cloudflare. Mm. 200,000. They probably can have a, a good pick of some of the top engineers in the world in those fields, right? I'm sure AWS and Azure and uh, Google Cloud, and all those are doing great too. But because Cloudflare is much smaller, but they have to compete with the big guys they need yes. something differentiated. They need to be able to attract people and they're not all going to be able to pay them necessarily quite as much. You wrote about this recently about all of these uh, big tech kind of monopolies are making it more expensive for everybody else to compete with them by giving so much comp and, and all that, right? So Cloudflare has to figure out a way out of this problem. Yeah, yeah no, I think I personally have owned uh, some of the big tech companies for almost like last four years. And... I feel like I still haven't appreciated how big of a competitive advantage they have in recruiting until recently. Mm -hmm. uh, when I kind of sat down and kind of, you know, looked at their operating expenses uh, per headcount and gross profit per headcount, it's crazy. Like, you know, what basically that shows you, like it kind of costs two seventy thousand to $300,000 operating expenses per headcount for almost all tech companies in the Valley. Because, you know, good talent is expensive. Yep. Talent in general in the Valley is expensive. But not all companies can have 500,000, a million, or even for, for Meta's case, it was 1.4 million gross profit per headcount. So to me, it, it become obvious that big tech and the rest of the tech companies are operating in a very uneven field, right? Yeah. Big tech companies basically set the price for the talent or the raw materials to build these great companies, right? But only a handful of them have those incredible gross profit per headcount, right? So I have noticed that a lot of investors, uh, analysts uh, are kind of angry and like uh, these management these managements in different tech companies are just stealing money from us. But my question to them, like how exactly are you planning to hire engineers and salespeople? when a big tech company is basically offering them $400,000, $500,000 yeah. as total compensation. How are you going to convince anyone to work for Okta, Cloudflare, Datadog, all these you know, up and coming tech companies for $150,000? Because even if you recruit them, even if you recruit them today, if they know their friends and their peers are getting paid like $300,000, $400,000 from Meta, from Google, from Apple, Amazon, AWS, right? What they will do, they will probably work for these companies for a couple of years or so, and then they'll just apply to these big tech companies and then they just move it. Like, I'm not saying everyone will do that, but enough of them will do that yeah. to make sure that these, I mean, the management of these companies, like Datadogs and like Cloudflare of the world, will start thinking, oh, you know what? We have to basically pay them to keep this talent pool. And I think there are a couple of things that happened, like let's say last five years or so. You know, if I were, let's say, Matthew Prince or Olivier Pommel trying to hire someone, you know, my pitch would be, hey, look, we are up and coming. We can't pay you as much as Google or Meta. We can't do that. 
What you can do is I can promise you a better work environment, like less bureaucratic environment, like you can build things, yep. you can see things. Uh, you don't have to go through jumps and hoops of like five different committees to make sure that this feature ships, right? And actually, many of the big tech companies don't have probably alternative because they are scaled platform. They have billions of people on their platform. So any even minor mistake is amplified, right, and gets a lot of attention. If you are making a minor mistake in, let's say, in, in some of the smaller tech companies, yeah, you, you may get some hit, but it's not going to be like a Wall Street Journal front page news, right? So yeah, that's number one. Like, hey, you get a better work environment, less bureaucratic uh, work environment. And we can pay you our stock. Like it's uh, Google's market cap is probably not going to from two trillion to four trillion, right? Uh, or one trillion to three trillion. Like you know, you can't really compound your capital three, four, five, ten times. But we are just five, ten billion, twenty billion market cap company or whatever. You know, and if we really build a great company, we can make it hundred billion dollar company, two hundred billion dollar company in five years, ten years, and you can grow your wealth. You know, along with the companies that we are building. And I think for a long time, that seemed quite a credible pitch. Like if I, I was just imagining if I were in, in this like kind of employee's shoes, I would think that's credible because if you think about like, you know, there are a lot of companies, Shopify, Twilio, Cloudflare, Datadog, like uh, I, I think Shopify and Twilio specifically. I actually remember the number uh, on Twilio because I kind of mentioned this in one of my deep dives. If you joined in like sometime in 2017 at Twilio, you basically, the stock basically became 20x from wow. like sometime in 2017 to like top of 2021. So I'm not saying everyone got 20x, but I'm pretty sure most of the people who worked, uh, who joined Twilio get 5x, 10x, 15x over the last like three, four, five years if we're taking 2022 out. So it, it was a very credible pitch. People and you know, employees could actually believe that pitch because it's it's credible. It's not something made up, right? They could see that their peers are getting actually making more money by working at this company because the stock is going up a lot faster than these big tech companies. Like big tech companies did fine, but it's not nothing like 5x, 10x, 20x, right? You know, over the course of like three, four years. And it is it is also true these companies are less bureaucratic. So this was a credible pitch. Now, I guess my, you know, my concern is like after kind of looking at these numbers in more details, I think at one hand, these companies are getting bigger, right? So these are not $100 million, $200 million revenue companies. These are like a billion dollar, $2 billion revenue companies, right? So over time, they may become slightly more bureaucratic, but definitely not as bureaucratic as let's say big tech companies, but they will be slightly more bureaucratic. And there's always this new and up and coming uh, other startups like who are at like 100 million, 200 million, right? So if you are playing with that, you know, you can probably join a startup, a private company, although there are lots of other problems. Let's not get into that. Uh, but then the other thing like about the stock price, that is also a big question mark now, right? Like whether yeah. these companies can be theoretically, yes, they are probably in this, uh, many of them are probably around 2018, even some of them are probably 2017, 2019, like around this level in terms of market cap. But there's a lot of question mark because of the rates, because of the, in a lot of investors are now asking about uh, margin structure and all that. So yeah, so I think one of the things that I have been thinking probably a lot more deeply than I used to is how exactly a company can be able to recruit talent in a more, efficient way. Like I know Adyen has an advantage because most of their employees are in Netherlands, right? Even Shopify has a lot of their workforce in Canada, which is clearly not as expensive talent market as the Silicon Valley. But the thing that really concerns me that uh, many of these up and coming Silicon Valley tech companies will have a really hard time to lower their compensation. Because if I were Mark Zuckerberg or Sundar Pichai, I would actually maintain that. I would actually maintain mm. the high cost for this. Like what I would do is basically, if I were Zuckerberg, I would basically main, try to make sure how to improve the productivity of my workforce. And I would think, if I were Sundar Pichai or Mark Zuckerberg, like I would think this is an excellent opportunity to hire the top talents from anywhere from other parts of Silicon Valley. I don't have to necessarily increase my workforce, I can just show the door for, let's say, below performers or you know, underperformers and create some space. I think many of these companies are probably doing that. Like Meta just laid off 10, 11,000. They, they may do that gradually over time more, but it also creates space to hire 
back a lot of top talents that are you know, out there all across the many Silicon Valley companies. That's something I'll be paying more attention to than I did. But yeah, like I think I should mention because these things can be influenced by you know what you own. I do own Meta, Google, and Amazon uh, shares. Mm. So it, it's possible I'm just over extrapolating some of my existing biases. But I, I do think it's, it's a definitely a concern if I were hiring, uh, if I were in the talent market. There is probably a bit of a lull moment here in the sense, I think these companies, like obviously Big Tech is not hiring right now. They're kind of in a retreat mode, but I doubt they will be in the retreat mode for too long. Right, so they will probably come back to the talent market maybe after a year or so. So now they'll this up and coming Silicon Valley tech companies, like you know smaller companies, they will probably still be able to hire well, let's say next six to twelve months. But beyond that, I think the big tech will probably come back at some point when when the economy sort of stabilizes. So the question about total comp, like you know, a lot of the time I myself used to kind of think, yeah, these companies are investing aggressively and over time as they scale. Uh, they will be much more profitable. I'm questioning that assumption deeply, and it's not the stock price. I don't think it's the stock the stock price going downwards that's influencing me. I have every incentive to buy these companies if they are lucrative and, and uncompelling. But these are the kind of questions that really give me pause. If you want to believe the profitability of many of these tech companies, you have to believe two things. That the total compensation for the engineers will be more or less similar or somewhat downwards. It can't go up like 10, 20% from here, let's say mm. from now to next five to seven years. That's one. And the number two is you have to believe this, this new up and coming companies will be more efficient than their predecessor software companies. So if you look at most of the software companies, and see how much, how many employees they had when they reached this ten billion dollar revenue or ten billion dollar gross profit, and if you put that number and multiply that with the average total compensation that engineers or salespeople get today, and then you see that there's not much profitability left even after like five seven years. So mm-hmm. you have to assume that these companies will be much more efficient in terms of utilizing their workforce. Maybe they will be, but that's what something basically we'll have to assume. There, so far, I personally haven't seen much of an evidence. So for example, one thing that I did, look, okay, let's go back when they were as small as these companies are now. So let's say a billion dollar of revenue, a billion dollar of gross profit. And if you go back you know, in those times, uh, it kind of looks similar. It kind of looks, you know, they are scaling in the same way when they were smaller. So, but we don't know, like uh, the trajectory from 1 billion to 10 billion can be vastly different for some of these companies. And like, you know, the companies that we are discussing, maybe I'm a bit biased in the sense that I, maybe because I have a slightly positive perception about both of these companies because I studied them uh, and I'm not making broad stroke judgment. Now, on these three companies, so for example, Cloudflare, like if Cloudflare can pull off workers, then yes, they, you know, their journey from a billion dollar to 10 billion would be probably vastly different from, let's say, uh, Salesforce or uh, ServiceNow. ServiceNow is like probably four or five billion dollar gross profit. So yeah, so Cloudflare journey can be different. That's what basically you have to assume or, or believe. And I'm not sure you know, how comfortable I'm, I'm with those assumptions, but those are definitely in the realm of the possibility that both those assumptions can be true. It's possible that compensation for engineers and salespeople is just too high and they'll go through some sort of rationalization, which, like I said, I'm not sure because big tech probably should maintain those level of salaries. It is a competitive advantage for them. And, and the second is their trajectory from here to there, here to, let's say, 5 billion, 10 billion gross profit. That is possible, I guess, uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that how that evolves. Yeah, you, you bring up so many good points. Uh, one of them is, even if big tech is retreating somewhat in hiring, it's a relative thing, right? So if they're retreating yeah. by one X, but the smaller players are hurting more and they're retreating by two X or three X or going out of business, big tech is still gaining in that. And if they can come back quicker, well, I'm going to make an analogy. In the same way that uh, Google and Apple taking a big cut on their app stores is 
preventing a bunch of businesses from ever existing, right? If you have a business where by giving away 30% or 15%, you just can't make it, right? It's not a high profit business. You just won't exist at all. So you end up with a bunch of stuff where like selling coins on Candy Crush or whatever, like pure profit. But there's a whole cohort of businesses that may have existed without that cut. I feel like big tech keeping salaries very high for engineers and and I don't know, designers and salespeople, by keeping those values very high, it's kind of like doing the same thing, right? It's like a tax on the industry and anything below that that may exist if you could pay engineers 100K, but can't exist if you have to pay them 300K, right. like, th th those companies won't even get started. So the hope with this kind of slowdown and recession and the kind of tech bubble popping and all that stuff, the hope for me was, well, maybe we're going to see tons of great new companies because startups will be able to hire now. And like it's going to free up a bunch of talented engineers that could have been doing more useful things for the world than like trying to optimize by 0.00001% some yeah. color on some Google ad page somewhere. Or I hope that's what's going to happen. But maybe the alternate scenario is just that big tech is so strong and profitable that they're going to keep the floor high. And it's actually the smaller players that are going to hurt even more and... I don't know. I still believe that the very best startups and the very best ideas get stronger in these types of downturns. But maybe big tech is the difference with 2002, right? Or the other types of tech winters. And another very interesting aspect of this is how human psychology works is that when it felt best to go work for these tech companies was when it was the worst time, right? In 2001, <laughs> you were looking back and seeing the yeah. stock charts going vertical and you're like, oh, wow, my stock comp is, is going to be worth a fortune, right? And that was the most dangerous time. And right now yes. everybody's like, ah, stock SBC and like, I want to be paid in cash. And, and now maybe the best time to take some of these jobs if things turn around and then... I don't know, five years, uh, the RSUs do well, right? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe we're in a longer, uh, difficult period for tech. If you forget about valuations, if you only look at the businesses and, and yes. the cash coming in, these are still very, very, very good businesses, right? Super high recurring revenue, super high gross margins, potentially very good unit economics. They're reinvesting a ton in growth, but a lot of these businesses, if they took their foot off the gas with hiring, we would hope that the margins would scale well. We don't see it. And that's the thing, right? At some point, it's all like, well... Is the theory correct that they could do it if they wanted to, but they just don't because it creates more value to just keep growing faster? I guess that's a question that someday we're going to see the answer to. Yeah, so I think obviously some people mentioned this, like if it's so hard to be profitable, how come this PE, you know, private equity guys just buy these companies and then make it profitable, right? Right. I think, yeah, there's definitely some to that, something to that. I, first of all, I personally don't think these are structurally unprofitable businesses, right? I agree. And... I do think we have to level set that to make sure that we are not arguing against a straw man case, right? These companies are still worth 10, 20, 30 billion dollars, right? So obviously market is not saying these are structurally unprofitable business. These are, the like market still believes, and I do think these are, these can be profitable businesses. Now the question, the crux of the debate, I think, is how profitable, Right. So, yes, PE companies can buy these companies, PE, you know, PE funds can buy these companies and turn them into profitable business. Right. Because if I give you an assignment, if I give Matthew Prince an assignment, hey, Matthew, you have to go out there and make this a 10 percent gap EBIT margin business by the next three years. I guarantee you he'll be able to do it. Oh, we could probably do it within six months. Right. <laughs> Just fire a few people. and <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the assignment. I am giving you just in three years, in five years, you have to do this. But when you are building a company with no time horizon in mind, you are not trying to get to a particular margin, right? Uh, to flip it to public market again or to flip it to another PE buyer, right? right? You are with this asset. Whether you like it or not, you have to keep building it. So uh, if you're a public company, if you're especially a founder, I think they have a very different approach to in a situation like this, yes, they can be profitable, but that is not that way. I think a lot of the times like people think, oh, they can be profitable. Of course they can be profitable. These, these are $2 billion businesses. What do you, you think, they, you know, a $2 billion revenue business or $1 billion revenue business can't be profitable if they want to? Yeah, at 80% yeah. gross margins, right? <laughs> yes, they can. Obviously they can. Like, you know, but at what cost? If they become profitable, mm. if Cloudflare becomes 20%, let's say margin uh, profitable in next two years, three years, obviously they're not probably hiring as much. Obviously, they are probably not doing some of the other stuff that they would. Uh, so definitely there is a trade-off here between top line and margin, right? Yeah. 
it's a balance game like most things in life you have to balance these things and last three to five years was just you know probably not so balanced like people were literally you know rewarded to accelerate their top line regardless of profitability right so it would probably be a different sort of balancing environment in the next let's say three years or so so we'll have probably some clarity in terms of what is the extent of the trade-off but yeah that is the key debate here's something that i want to specifically it's not about cloudflare or datadog but i think somewhat related i was looking at crowdstrikes yesterday's earnings yesterday being 29th of November, uh, right? So they mentioned like, you know, they have this slide of their long-term operating margin. And this is very common. Like most software companies have this and they have, op- you know, long-term operating margin as 20 to 22%. But that's a non-gap number, right? Mm. What's their stock-based compensation as percentage of revenue today? 23% in nine months so far. So even if you assume this 22, 23% of SBC as, as stock based compensation as percent of revenue will go from 22% to, let's say, 12% or 10%, which, by the way, never happened. Like, if you look at the like, last 10 years, 10, 12 years of other companies who scale from, let's say, a billion dollar revenue or $2 billion revenue, $10 billion revenue, what, what did their stock based compensation did in this period? It didn't go down. It kind of stayed flat or go, did actually went up, right? So, we're assuming, and I, I'm not saying like, it will go from 22% to 32%. I think that it just doesn't work that way. But to assume that from 22% to 12%, 10%, even if you assume that, that's a 10% margin business. And the thing is, management is not even attempting to make it. Like they are, they are under the impression it's a 20% margin business. So if you don't measure it, you can't really aim it, right? So they may feel great. Oh, we actually reached our long-term margin target, 22%. What's the SBC expenditure revenue? 20%. So you basically have a break-even business, right? If that is a long-term target, that is structurally destructive. I feel like all these long-term target things are kind of meaningless, right? They're just telling a bunch of analysts kind of what they want to hear, but over time, this, they're all going to change them and it's going to fall somewhere very different, right? If you told Matthew Prince or George Kurtz, like, okay, you can't grow faster than 15%, like do what you want, but cap it at 15%, right? What would the margins be? It, it, they would have great, great margins, right? But the value of growth for these companies where revenue is extremely sticky and high margin, high gross margin, is the growth is worth so much that they're not even thinking about trying to optimize for margin. So they give kind of like all the same numbers, right? All of these companies have kind of the same, same target operating margin yeah. numbers. You look at Snowflake, like they're just telling analysts kind of what they want to hear, but I don't put any stock in those numbers, really. I think they could tweak them. Like if they pull the lever one direction or the other, they could get almost any number they want in between those things. The question is how much value is created by each approach, by each kind of set of you know levers. No, I think uh, that's an interesting thought experiment. Like if you made Matthew Prince to grow 15%, what would the margin look like? Yeah, like I said, I, I don't think these are structurally unprofitable. This can be profitable business. My suspicion is, obviously that is subject to change based on how things evolve. These are actually 10% margin business, even like terminally speaking. And why is that? Because the cost, the raw material cost is just so high, right? There are elephants out there who make sure the cost of these raw materials don't really go down rapidly or precipitously. And so one way, kind of if everyone majored in computer science, probably yes, then supply would just go high. These things take time. Like I, I looked at the numbers, the numbers are not crazy. People are still not graduating with CS measure as, uh, you know, it's not, Probably. Yeah, maybe AI is going to make engineers much more productive, right? Copilot. Copilot is getting better all the time. Yeah. So that's another thing. I feel like that's one way I can be wrong in my assumption. If AI becomes such a huge force that makes a lot of the density of war, you know employees re- irrelevant, or not not relevant, like less relevant, right? That's something. Like I think I feel like yes, like when there is a necessity, you know you you tend to come up with things that kind of solves your problem. There's so many companies out there, so many companies in Silicon Valley, like if they're all like 10%, 5%, you know, gap EBIT margin business, obviously it's not a lucrative, it's super lucrative for the next set of founders to come in and build businesses, right? If the cost for the engineers remains so exceedingly high, right? Hmm. So yeah, so it is very much possible that AI may be a lot bigger force than many of us 
seem to think, especially in the context of how many engineers you really need uh, yeah. to these products. I think that's the other thing. I think as you're growing super fast, right? If you're growing 50% a year or something, like that's real big, right? Organic growth of that level, like I can understand why you need a lot more engineers and everything. But as these businesses mature, they don't all have to take the big tech road of like, we're going to hire everybody we can find and just figure out something for them to do. I think a lot of these people are not doing that much, right? They're defensive hires. But if you run the business in a different way, if you don't over hire, if you don't try to you know suck up all of the engineers from the pool so others don't get them, in theory, right? We're not seeing it right now, but in theory, all this tech should scale very well, right? To run the same service for 5 million customers shouldn't take like 10 times more engineers than for 500,000. It shouldn't. It just shouldn't, right? The same software can be copied to a bunch of new servers. You can auto-scale servers in the cloud. There's a bunch of leverage from the tech that should be a fixed cost. But right now, that's not what we're seeing. But I feel like as if they mature these businesses and they're well-run for the shareholders, they shouldn't need a sales force that keeps going up, right? All the time. At some point, you don't need half of the planet to be your sales force. I don't know. Um, Maybe I'm idealistic. Maybe it, there, there's something that's going to keep everybody just hiring and hiring all the time. And when they have $20 billion in revenue, they're all going to have 200,000 employees. But at some point, it's like, what are all these people doing? I think what we're going to see with all the layoffs that, that are going on right now mm -hmm. is maybe a lot of these people were not doing that much that created value for the companies. That's always true, isn't it? I feel like yeah. that's always true. I, I think that you know, if you go to any company, it doesn't have to be tech company. Any oh, company. Yeah. Government and yeah. Right. That's how it is. I think, you know, it's not like everyone equally contributes to the bottom line. It's very lopsided in any company. And I, I think the harder thing is to figure out which people are basically making that happen. It's not like, say, yep. I think it's, it's, it's a very fair statement to say uh, in any company, probably 20% of employees are basically, you know, contributing 80% of the value or 90% of the value. Right. And I get like the, when I guess the way kind of Elon Musk did. I don't disagree with him that Twitter was probably overstaffed. And I, I think even if Musk was not there, that even the previous management would fire people, uh, a lot of a lot of the people that they had. The difficult part, I think, as kind of news flow came along afterwards, it, it becomes apparent. Like he ended up laying off a lot of people that he actually needs. So he was kind of, you know, hiring them back and giving uh, new offers to come back. Uh, so that's the hard part. You can, you know, you can probably go into any company and just fire 20% of the people, but which 20 Hard part. If in a week you fire half the people by looking at their printouts of code, like you're <laughs> going to make a bunch of mistakes, right? But right. I feel like tech is probably a bit different. If you're, a, I don't know, a farming company or a contractor building houses, well, maybe like 30% of your people are like slow and they're dragging their feet and they're not doing their work or they're doing bad work that needs to be undone by other. And like, okay, you could remove a bunch of people, and it, but it scales more linearly. If you're in tech, if you have like a few really, really good engineers, uh, WhatsApp was like, I don't know, 50 employees running a, a billion people service. You get tons of leverage from the actual tech, like the computers and the software are basically virtual employees doing work for you. That's where you can get some of that leverage that is harder to get in other industries. If you're Boeing and building planes and you fire half of the technicians, well, the planes are not going to get built. But if Maybe Twitter went too far, but a bunch of other companies, the software and the servers and everything can probably be maintained by a lot fewer people. And the question is, how productive are the others, right? Cloudflare seems to hire a lot, but be very productive, right? They have a bunch of graphs showing the pace of new release of products. And you're, you're like, okay, these people are like building products and they're shipping them. But mm. a bunch of other companies, you look at the number of employees and the curve looks like exponential, right? And then you look at the output and it's like, well, most of the service are kind of the same. Nothing's improving that fast. Things are kind of getting worse, right? I don't know. <laughs> I feel some companies are much more ripe for a kind of reset of... Uh, expectations for how many people are needed to do the actual thing. I, I do want to highlight one particular point, uh, and that is, it is hard to kind of paint a broad brush and say all these business are 10% gap with margin. My guess is some of them, a couple of them will probably prove to be a lot higher margin business and a lot more profitable business. But I think I'd be personally surprised if the average, let's say, gap EBIT margin for uh, most cloud or software companies in 2030 is like 20 percent. Oh yeah, for most of them. Like if I was thinking just like Cloudflare or that, some are, those are some of the best ones, right? If we're looking across the board, a bunch of them have basically no moat, right? 
like Monday and Asana are almost selling the same product, right? And they're growing super fast. But if one of them raises price or just like people can switch to it, like a bunch of those are have a lot of competition and few yeah. bears. Some others are more differentiated and they have more scale advantages, right? Or say CrowdStrike or uh, it's machine learning stuff has more data points than a, a new competitor, a new startup, or like you can try to differentiate between some of them that have no barriers to entry and some that, that do like Cloudflare's infrastructure and its talent pool. And, yeah. and this, like that's hard to replicate. So I totally agree with you that the average of a lot of these companies, like maybe the average is zero. I don't know, because there's a bunch of crappy ones that, are, that probably couldn't yeah. exist without a lot of free money, a lot of high price stocks, a lot of like a bunch of their uh, customers are people getting VC money on one side and there's a bunch of recycling of money in the ecosystem in the tech ecosystem if that goes away a bunch of these companies probably don't have very real businesses but if we're only thinking about some of the very best ones I feel like at maturity some of those may have like 30 40 percent margins I don't know it depends what they want to do what the rest of the opportunity is right if they start to saturate their markets and they're like okay now's the time to go profitable well I think we saw an example of this yesterday Cloudflare raised some prices on some of their CDN stuff for the first time in 12 years and mm -hmm. in that 12 years the plan has the same name but what's inside of the plan is like you know 50 times better and bigger and more right yeah. their free plans today have more stuff than their paid plans had 10 years ago right but if cloudflare was like okay we want to we want to step on the profitability pedal they could raise prices here and there and a bunch of their stuff is like pretty mission critical right people are not going to be like okay we don't need ddos protection anymore we're just going to cut that right so yeah. i feel like keeping low prices is indirectly a reinvestment in growth, right? Because they're probably yeah. growing more because the prices are lower, so it's easier to acquire new customers. And then once people are on board, people like stick around for five, 10 years, like the, the growth churn is very low, right? So I don't know, some of the very best companies can do that. Some of the others, if they raise their prices, people will turn around and go to a competitor doing the exact same thing. So it's yeah. a really a case by case basis thing. Uh, I think maybe we should talk about Datadog a little bit. <laughs> We're forgetting them a bit. I, it's probably fresh in your memory because you just did a deep dive. Yeah. I know them. I don't know them as well as Cloudflare, but if we wanted to do a quick overview of them, I, I can give us a start. Sure. And you, the general idea of Datadog, the way I understand it, is that their bread and butter is observability. Today in the cloud, you have all kinds of services and servers and apps, and you have to keep track of a lot of stuff, right? Make sure it runs well. And uptime is money, right? If your website goes down, if your website is slow and hard to reach, every second, every minute that's going on, you're probably losing customer money. Your people may just like, quit your service and go somewhere else. So it's very, very important to keep all that stuff running smoothly. So what Datadog offers is basically like kind of a dashboard. And what you do is you connect their agents and their APIs and their frameworks and all that stuff, SDKs, into your infrastructure right mm -hmm. so into your services and your software and these kind of like software sensors are sending the logs and the data back to datadog and they do a bunch of compute and, and give you a nice dashboard so you can monitor like okay there's a problem with this server over there oh like the latency on this app is, is spiking right now what's going on right do we need to fire up more servers can you can auto scale with that kind of stuff so that's kind of where they started but then there's another big trend that they're writing where it used to be that developers and the people in operations were kind of like separate. So you had the yep. people on one side, they were building the software, and then they threw it on the other side and said, okay, you over there, like, figure out how to run it, right? To put it on servers and put it on something that customers can interface with. And that's getting more uh, squished together. They call it DevOps. Uh, it's kind of one word, right? So the people making the stuff and running the stuff are often the same people yep. or working closely together because now that it's all in the cloud, right? It's, it's not a bunch of people, like, racking servers on-prem and, like, it's, it's kind of a different job. And that's further evolving into DevSecOps, where you bring in security too, right? Because that dog has gone into security recently. Uh -huh. And so they're kind of like riding that secular wave of all the stuff going on the cloud, all the stuff becoming serverless and disaggregated. And like, instead of having one big monolithic app running on one server over there, well, part of the app is running in that cluster over there, and part of the app is over there, and part of the app is a, an API at a, a totally different company. Like All that stuff is kind of glued together. And so to monitor all that stuff that's kind of spread all around the world and around data centers, you need that kind of like central dashboard, a central view into all of it. And that's what Datadog is trying to do. And the security stuff that they're doing, it's interesting because all of the data that they're gathering for the observability part and the performance mm -hmm. part, mm -hmm. all that stuff is useful for security, right? It's a lot of the same logs. They like to say that they have beachfront access to your infrastructure, right? Once you put them in that beachfront 
can be used to build all kinds of other products. So, so like many others, like CrowdStrike, right? They are building these new models all the time. I think they have like 14 now or something. Their customers are increasing the number of modules they're using over time. So a lot of their sales are to the same base of customers. Mm. Uh, and one thing that I learned from your deep dive that's kind of cool is that apparently just before IPO in 2019, they got a, an offer from Cisco. I think it's rumored. I don't think it's official. An offer yeah. from Cisco for $8 billion to be acquired. So I think Olivier, the founder, can use my French for once. <laughs> Olivier, the founder, uh, said to grow to a large company, one of the hardest things is not to sell along the way, right? Because the better you are as a company, the more people are going to try to acquire you. Well, and I, I didn't mention this on my deep dive, but I actually, you know, after publishing my deep dive, I came to this other news that about like potential acquisition offer for uh, Datadog. Apparently, Salesforce also tried to buy Datadog after Datadog went to hmm. public. I think if I remember correctly, for like $20 billion. So oh, wow. I think it's close to, I think it's probably 20, 20, 22 billion today. So yeah, so like, you know, Salesforce actually tried to buy them. Again, allegedly, I'm not sure. I just saw like some press reports, uh, media reports that Salesforce might might have been interested in buying Datadog. So yeah, Olivier was absolutely right. It remains a very hard thing to not sell your company along the way as you kind of, you know, build your business. I think the classic there is... Uh... Yeah, it was offered to Zuckerberg to buy Facebook for a billion dollar. And I'm sure it happens all the time with every every like company getting tons of traction. Like yeah. you're the bell of the ball. Everybody wants to dance with you. Uh, the other thing, one of the reasons why we're talking about both Cloudflare and Datadog is they have some similarities. I think they're both very, very high velocity in development. Mm -hmm. They come out with new products all the time. I love their website. They have great graphic designers. Datadog has some of the best like blog posts. They have all these cartoons and... Anyway, that's a small thing, but got to yeah. have a company with a, a nice brand image, right? Just the dog is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they come out with new products all the time. But what's interesting is that the products that they come out with seem to have a pretty high hit rate. And that seems to be because they're not pushing them. They're getting pulled, right? So customers are like, hey, we wish we had like this new feature or we wish like some of the same dashboard could cover like CICD stuff or the even earlier in development or customers come up with feature requests and Datadog builds that stuff for willing customers, right? The, the products are getting pulled out of them. So that's well, always a good sign and may explain why they, their uh, NRR is, is so high, right? They're, they're selling a lot more to the same customers on yeah. top of being a consumption model. They're not pure SaaS, which, which has pros and cons, but they're selling by hosts, not by uh, customer. Yeah. No, I think uh, one of the unique things about Datadog that definitely stood out, to me at least, when I was looking at like companies or like, you know, any tech companies that are growing more than 50% over the last 12 months, Datadog is the only company who basically spends more on R&D than they spend on sales and marketing, hmm. right? So, so for example, most of the tech companies, a typical structure is basically they spend 20 to 25% of their revenue in R&D and 40 to 50% of their revenue in sales and marketing. Datadog is the opposite. They spend like... 25 to 30% on sales and marketing, and they spend usually 40% on R&D, right? So they're the only company. And I think, as you were mentioning before, like the, the reason you know, their hit rate is so high that these are most like pull through rather than, rather than push to their respective customers. They just build their product and they don't have to necessarily sell them. So one of the things that you know, Olivier mentioned was even when they kind of scaled, from SMB to enterprise level. And I think this is a very common story. And this is actually a common theme for both Cloudflare and you know, Datadoc, even for some of the other tech companies as well. They all started with, like focusing on SMBs. And then yep. they, you know, and it's funny, even, even in 2017, I think Datadoc used to have like 40% of their revenue from SMB. Now it's like 17%. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, long, not a long time, like, you know, four years, five years. S similar story with Cloudflare as well. Like the small, you know, smaller customers used to have significant contribution to their overall top line. Now it's not so much. So the way kind of Oliver explained is even when they kind of, you know, it, there is no difference regardless of the size of the customers that you are selling. It's very bottom up. So even if they start with a CIO at a, at a like, large enterprise company, the CIO will basically, you know what, go to our engineers, talk to them. Uh, you have to convince them. And basically after, you know, they kind of sell to those developers, like we're actually like in a more, more of a bottom-up approach, 
Datadog ends up later with the CIO, with the bills and forms and everything, right? So Datadog doesn't have to necessarily convince the CIO. It's not a very top, yeah. uh, top of it. It's more of a bottom-up approach. That makes a lot of sense why they don't have to spend as much in sales and marketing. And these are very valuable dollars. If you don't, if you can sell your products without, you know, sales and marketing, you know, that dollar For can be sure. spent on R&D. That's a very valuable uh, utilization of your dollar. The only concern I have is because it's unique, like, you know, it's something like this is perhaps their moat, right? This is perhaps like, you know, for many of these small tech companies, it's so hard to figure out what exactly is their moat because they're, they're still in the early stage and it takes time to basically the moats to be formed, uh, most to be fully formed for everyone to appreciate and understand, oh, that's why you can't really disrupt that business. That's why you can't. Now we have just signs of moat, right? We, we're not really sure whether this is going to be a, much bigger moat in like five, 10 years time. So for example, in Datadox, for Datadox case, if they can maintain this operating cost structure, like they, if they can continue to spend less in sales and marketing and more in R&D as they scale from like 2 billion to 5 billion, 10 billion, that will like create, a, that, that will end up creating some sort of uh, innovation mode or product mode uh, over time, ecosystem mode, platform mode, right? But the only concern I have, like that's the that's the bull case. The bear case is basically this is what Jeff Lawson used to say, uh, <laughs> Atulia, like oh you know he even wrote a book, right? Yeah, uh, on, I read it. <laughs> yeah, all right, so uh, so he he used to be a big evangel on product led growth, and that worked. It worked for a long time. It did seem like you know Twilio was doing what I'm saying about Datadog, yeah. like you know they are just building great products, they are investing more R and D. But the challenge with usage based model is your customer will always end up having a very power law distribution. You know, the revenue distribution will have power law uh, and a tendency. So the top 10% Datadox customers may drive like 80, 90% of their overall revenue. Let's say five years from, I don't know what's the company, like we didn't really disclose it, but my suspicion is that's how it may end up, like the top 10, 20%. And if you are a top 10, 20% customer, you probably know that you are a big customer yeah. for, for Datadog. Now the trick is- You have leverage. Right, the, the challenge I think that Datadog may have, Oliver is explaining how they price their product, right? So they say, hey, like, you know, uh, before launching a product, we were thinking about uh, launching this product at like $12 per instance, right? And the night before, we decided, you know what, let's go with 15. And they started with 15, and probably a few months, a few years later, they, they increased it to 18. And he said, there is no difference. Like, you know, there, hmm. like, you know, so, so one interpretation is yes, like the customers don't really care about price. They can just, you know, they think it's a good enough price. It's a reasonable price. The other thing is the when I realize that I am like top 10 customers of Datadog, I want that to be $8 per instance. I will have that power. Like I, if I use like 14 different products, like 20 different products of Datadog, I want everything to be like cheap. So that my question, my, my concern is for them to generate outsized profit margins, they have to be able to withstand that pressure. And that is possible if, if they think this customer is bluffing. I can price this customer at $18 and this customer can't do anything because he, this customer can't actually switch. Yeah, you have to be differentiated in some way, right? You can't just turn around and go to Splunk or someone else and get the right. exact same thing for a cheaper price. And there is truth to that. I, I do want to uh, mention that there is truth to that. There is switching cost. Uh, it's not like you can just rip it off the next day if you don't like the price. Yeah, it's built in a lot of deep software like the SDKs and the agents. Like you can do it. It's, it's not literally built into the code, but it's it's not just a switch that you flip either, right? But I think that's a key debate for Datadog. I feel like if in 2030, if we see Datadog is still spending less on sales and marketing and more on R&D, I think this company will be much more tier business, much, much mm. more, you know, strong shape than any of their competitors. Right now, they have some competitors, like, you know, Splunk has sort of like similar platform. They they also, you know, uh, are focusing on cloud. And if you look at their like cloud focused revenue, they're basically growing at a similar growth rate. They used to grow at a similar growth rate in the last three years. I think this year, Datadog is growing faster than Splunk's cloud. So again, maybe, it's because of the you know faster product iteration and the innovation that we are seeing on Datadog versus let's say some of, some of the competitors and that difference can grow larger and larger over time. In my opinion, it's very important. It's super important for that 
sort of narrative to sustain. Like, yes, we don't have to spend as much on sales and marketing because we are differentiating through product and our customers, it's a very bottom-up approach. We don't have to necessarily sell it to the CIOs of the world to convince uh, to buy our products. Yeah, I have so many things to say. First, to be fair to, to Jeff Lawson and to Twilio, the problem with them seem to be more that they don't have much leverage over the cost to the telecoms, right? They don't get... Um, it's a variable cost to them, right? So they don't yeah, yeah. scale as well as... So So maybe the kind of like developer-led, product-led kind of thing is still a good idea. And maybe Datadog is in a better position to do that more profitably than Twilio. For Twilio's case, I was actually specifically mentioning Uber. You have a big customer with lots of leverage and then right. poof, they disappear. And also WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is still a big customer for them. I just want to add this one point and I, that I, I'm interested and curious to hear what you think. So one of the things that I'm thinking about, like, Datadog may have a very bottom-up approach today in selling their, let's say, infrastructure monitoring, API, uh, or logs, logs management products. Uh, but obviously, they're now also getting into security and who knows what else in two years, three years, five years down the line, right? The question that I wonder, I don't have a good answer to it. I'd love to hear your perspective. Whether it can remain bottom-up as they kind of broaden their ecosystem, broaden their platform, maybe the infrastructure monitoring products or APIs or like even um, log management doesn't require, uh, it, it, like, you know, bottom up is totally fine for this kind of products. But is that also relevant for cloud security? Is that also relevant for XYZ uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's going to come up in, a, in the next three to five years? That's something I kind of wondered. I don't have a good answer to. I don't have a good kind of sense to how to think about it. But yeah, like I, I'd be curious if you have any thoughts on, on those points. I think that's a very, very good question. Um, I feel like the answer is maybe some kind of hybrid. Uh, (laughs) Maybe that's not satisfactory, but I feel like it's possible that you get in with the observability stuff by being like best of breed. You know, you do better there than almost anyone and people like engineers, they go get you, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe for the other products, then you get into your distribution power, right? You get the bundle because it's always a pull and a pull between if you're building something, you're like, okay, I want a best of breed of everything, right? Okay, but then you have like 17 different vendors and you have like lots of agents and SDKs and APIs and it's, it's a big mess, yeah. right? So most people seem to end up somewhere in between where they're like, okay, Microsoft is going to be like 10 of our things. And then for five others, we're going to go best of breed, right? We're going to have mm-hmm. like Zscaler or CrowdStrike there or Palo Alto or Splunk or Elastic or maybe Datadog, right? Maybe Datadog gets to be one of those. And then over time, they can bundle other stuff with it. And people are like, well, we could go get our security from like someone else, but like, ah, we can get it super cheaply with Datadog and the agent is already there. We have to flip a switch and it's on. And like, so I feel like a bunch of their other products don't have to be quite as good, quite as, as best of breed because they're just going to be bundled with, right? So maybe mm-hmm. Datadog over time can be kind of like a mini Microsoft, right? Microsoft has big distribution power on one side, like it makes everything simple. Everybody knows they go to one place, they get it all. And maybe for some other smaller subsection of the stack, people go to Datadog and they're like, okay, we're going to get like four things from you, 10 things from you, right? Maybe that's the way they get there. I also wonder if one of their advantages on cost is that they have a bunch of employees over in Europe. Like they're not all based in in Silicon Valley. Maybe it's the kind of ADN advantage, right? I don't know if they can, if it's a long-term thing, if everybody else is going to do more like geographical arbitrage now that more stuff is done remote. Uh, I know that Cloudflare is a very remote company, right? That's part of their advantage too. Even before the pandemic, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elastic too. Like some of these companies are almost like born remote uh, and they were kind of right. ready for the pandemic without missing a beat. But the advantage there can also be like I'm offering someone living in a very low cost environment a very nice salary, right? But maybe that salary doesn't have to be quite as high as if yeah. you were going to the office in Palo Alto, right? Or something. So maybe there's still some talent arbitrage there where you can tell people like you can still live where you want if you don't like the big city or the expensive parts of the country, but I don't know if that's sustainable no, I, as an inventor. I think you're, you're definitely onto something. I think those two have to be part of the answers to the talent cost problem. Like one is AI, whether it, yeah. AI can mitigate the need for the number of engineers that you may have to hire. I think lots of people 
listening to this, if they're not programmers, if they're not in that world, they may imagine that coding is like you're sitting all day thinking deep thought, doing like algebra and like just doing logic on screen, right? And building the app. But a huge portion of coding is I'm going to go and Google and, and try to find <laughs> something on Stack Overflow and cut and paste yeah. some code from someone. It doesn't work. You change a few things. You go on Discord and chat with someone. And then like a bunch of it is like template stuff and boilerplate stuff. And you're trying to like figure out. So, so if you can do that much more efficiently with something yes. like Copilot or Ghostwriter or these types of software that frees up, especially the good engineer's time for doing yep. higher value stuff, right? It's not so much that all of a sudden you don't need the engineers. It may right. be that the no, engineers yeah. you have produce more value because they're spending less time on the, the stuff that adds no value, right? It's, some stuff is creation and some stuff is just typing, right? <laughs> and if you have less of the, the make work typing stuff, well, maybe you get more of the rest. I, I hope so. Yeah, so yeah, so the other aspect that you mentioned is talent in the remote, uh, in the, like outside US uh, yep. talent. That has to be also part of the answer. Obviously, I think uh, US doesn't have really a monopoly on talent. Uh, talent is much more geographically dispersed and distributed than opportunities are, right? There are no so, Americans on this call today. <laughs> <laughs> well, no Americans. Uh, I am in the US though, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I meant yeah, originally. Right. But... Originally, not, yeah, right. So, but yeah, I totally think that can be part of an answer. But I don't see the evidence for Datadog's case though. Like, yes, they have a lot of employees in France. But when I was looking at like their operating expense per overhead, it's still like three hundred thousand mm. dollar. You know, if you look at Adyen's income statement, it's it's blindly obvious that they yeah. have some sort of uh, advantage. That's a good point, right? So that's one. And also, like Adyen is also like they don't hire; they really build the company much more efficiently. We can talk about the questions. We can talk about uh, potential concerns. Most of the answers seem to be TBD. I think the onus is on many of these management uh, management of these companies to at least show us the glimpse of what can be. Like, you know, most of us at least just assume that in these companies will scale it to a much more profitable business. Now there are obviously a lot less believers out there, right? So uh, they, it is a time for them to at least show a glimpse or at least some sort of, you know, like, I can't believe, like, I don't know, like, who, who exactly this management, uh, many of this, you know, management of these companies surround themselves with. Isn't there anybody to tell them that non-gap margins are just not going to work? That's not how the math works. I can't believe that people are still kind of, you know, boasting on, oh, we are 25% FCF margin or 20% non-gap margin. Like, yes, that, I understand. Like you, you wanted to say that you wanted to preach that to analysts in 2020, 2021. But it's clear that even if, I mean, since that analysis is never going to tell it on your face. Like, because if they tell you, you know, they'll be blacklisted, they will probably not get the invite, invitation for the call, all sorts of things. Like, you know, you can't expect that level of, you know, bold statements from sales analysts. But there should be people in, in those companies, in the investor relations department, who are talking to many buy side people, probably many other investors, who should be telling them, like, how exactly the math works. If you're managing your long term target to be 20, 22% operating margin and you're then give a very specific guideline. What is this long-term yeah. service compensation? Is it 5%, 10%? What is it, right? You can't talk about long-term margin unless you also give some sort of guidance. Like, you know, some companies talk about dilution. Like, that's not in your control. You can't really manage dilution. If the company trades at 50 times, 70 times revenue multiple, your dilution must be very minimal. You'll not be able to dilute your shareholders 5%, even if you try because the stock is so high, right? Now it's the opposite, right? So, you know, now you will probably dilute much higher than in the last couple of years. So you can't really target dilution. It's very hard. It's not in, under your control. What you can control is basically give some sort of guidance that this is the kind of stock-based compensation or maybe, you know, what sort of employee base you need. Those are the kind of things I, I think investors need to hear. And I suspect because I... It's not, I, I don't own personally Datadog or Cloudflare, but I do own some companies that have similar sort of concerns and, and dynamics. And uh, I'll be frank, I'm somewhat scared that if these companies, if this management is not surrounded by people who can tell them like how exactly the math works, then that's not going to be a good news for me. Yeah, I hope the very best CEOs, they're going to adapt and change with the times. But I feel like 
a lot of it is mimetic, right? Every company is doing what every other company is doing. They're all doing the same thing. And that's why I, I put almost no stock into like these long-term projections. Like they don't know, like Cloudflare was a CDN, right? <laughs> if they had given us 10 year projections 10 years ago, what would that have been, right? And so even now, like, especially with companies that have very high development velocity, like Datadog and Cloudflare, trying to predict out like five years, 10 years, like you, you can try to, general like percentage of revenue now but if you try to predict like what's the end markets that are going to be in what are the times going to be what are the products are going to be they're probably going to invent a bunch of stuff buy some m a like add on some yeah. modules that way like some of those could be huge hits and like become huge part of the company right you look at some companies where like i i was writing about nvidia recently right the data center stuff was zero six years ago <laughs> and now it's the majority of their revenue right so some companies are very fast moving like that like if you have a gravel pit somewhere you can probably predict out like five years ten years you're still going to be doing kind of the same thing but with these companies it's so hard so it's more about having good management that's going to be able to every day along the way make good decisions and all those good decisions they add up to a good end result right i totally agree and understand but i you still need to have a you still need to have the correct framework oh for sure right? for sure so if you have a wrong framework like you know if you're going the wrong direction then you know no matter what you see on the road it doesn't matter because you are completely you'll end up in a in a, in a different uh, destination right if you if you are under the impression that as a ceo your job is to basically post 30% FCF margin or 20% in a non-GAAP operating margin. You will deliver that, but you don't have the right framework. Yeah. Your stock will completely just move around based on what the Fed is doing, not necessarily what you know your business is doing, right? So as an investor, obviously I want to own businesses like I know Fed will always have an influence and role on what's going on, but I definitely don't want to buy companies that just moves under the whims of what Jerome Powell is thinking or, or doing, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah. that's what I'm concerned about. And I'm saying this is not a specific criticism to uh, these companies. There are a couple of companies that I own that have similar concerns. And if, if the management has wrong framework, I think shareholders may suffer in the long run. I totally agree. I guess I'm just not sure that what they're telling us in their presentations is anything like what they're thinking about the business internally, right? I hope you're right. That, that's the thing. If they are, that's probably a problem. <laughs> but I kind of doubt it. Maybe I'm optimistic, but I hope that they're thinking about it differently. And they're all kind of like saying the same thing. But that's what Alice want to hear. And for now, that's good, right? But as a mature business, I would be very, very surprised if they were still like giving out like, I don't know, 20 something percent SBC and they had like 5% gap margin. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think uh, in both Cloudflare and Datadog's case, it's also going to be a test of like, you know, everybody loved founders a little while ago. And now everybody's like, yeah, yeah get the founders out. They control everything and they're too rigid, right? And like, these are two uh, still founder-led companies. Uh, the founders own decent chunks of both. They have voting control in, in Datadog. I don't think they do in Cloudflare. I don't think Cloudflare mm -hmm. has dual class. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's also going to be a test of this kind of thing, right? Is this kind of like everything that's attributed to founders, right? Long-term thinking and bolder bets and better yeah. at keeping the culture and making the hard decisions when, you know, things on the ground change changes like these are going to be interesting to watch as uh, showcases of founder-led companies because there's fewer of them around these days no absolutely I, I know the tide has changed but i i still kind of a very founder friendly uh, investor right <laughs> i still maintain a lot of the bull market philosophy that people used to have about founders i would be very hard pressed to think Olivier, Matthew Prince, Michel Zatlin or uh, Alexis are just going to waste money for um, but just over hiring and all that. And these people own this business. They have significant yeah. ownership. They have a lot more voting power for data dog, but a significant part percentage of their personal wealth is probably these companies, right? So there is no, their incentives are highly aligned. So I share some of your optimism. Yes, like, you know, like I said, like last few years were a crazy time, crazy period, <laughs> like, you know, and you, you can have wrong framework. Uh, that's fine. Like, you know, if for you are, sure. Right. And if you talk to an investor and they're all saying, give us 50 percent growth and that's how we're investing, that's how you're hiring, that's how we're kind of you know, going. I, I get it. You can have wrong framework, but I share your optimism. It is highly likely that they will be able to figure out the right framework over time as kind of, you know, these things per se. I think a lot of people, perhaps including you know us, are still kind of I don't know, hoping that, you know, things are kind of going to be normalized and it's not going to be as bad. 
But let's say if the recession happens in 2023 and it's actually worse than feared, I think the message will be there to these management teams. These are not dumb people, right? <laughs> they should, like if Matthew Prince takes like 15 minutes of his day, he can figure it out that how exactly uh, shareholder value is created, how, how non-gap margins are just not a right framework. This shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes for <laughs> founders to figure that out. My only concern is like, you know, I don't know, like I'm not a billionaire. I'm not running this 10, $20 billion companies. Uh, who knows how I would behave if I were surrounded by all this kind of, you know, like in you know, yes men and women telling me how great I am, how great pro- company I built. I don't know, like, you know, but it shouldn't be hard. That's what I'm saying. Like, and I totally understand your sense of optimism. It, it shouldn't be hard to figure out that non-gap margins are not the thing that you should aiming for. The question always is, like the carrot and the stick, the, the extremes have been so high and low recently that does that distort management thinking, right? Mm. So last mm. year, when prices were super high, right, is that getting them to drink their own Kool-Aid and be like, oh, we're geniuses, we can do anything, <laughs> we can hire anyone. And yeah. now, like now, oh, okay, uh, a company is a complex thing, right? There's a bunch of sure. pushes and pull and macro noise and effects and employees. And so... These days, they miss out the expectations from the street by 1% and the stock has done like 20%, right? Is that going to give them PTSD in the other direction and be like too conservative, right? Too like, oh, now we're going to cut back on a bunch of stuff that was creating great value, right? But let's have a, a thought experiment for a second. Let's imagine that these are private businesses. They've never been put in the public markets. We're only looking at their financials because we're, I don't mm-hmm. know, we're on the cap table, right? Yeah. And we get reports. And we're looking at the, the revenue growth and the gross margins and all that stuff, employees, number of customers, uh, NRR. We're seeing all the same numbers for the past like five years of Datadog and, and Cloudflare, right? It's like, wow, these are doing super well, right? These are some of the best businesses in the world, right? So the stock movements on top of those fundamentals can affect psychology a lot for investors yeah. and probably for management too. No, I, I want to make one point absolutely clear. I am not asking Matthew Prince or Olivier or any of the companies that I own to be profitable next year, next quarter, or even two years from now. I just want them to have the right framework yep. and give them the message uh, that how they are thinking. Like, I don't know how to even interpret that. If they think that they want to get to like if they have like a different model, but they're not communicating with shareholders, like, no, I'm not <laughs> sure I, I, that's, that's the best way to give your shareholders the right message. Like the other thing is if I were Matthew Prince or Olivier, like I want to have the right kind of shareholders, right? Yeah. I, I just, I, I don't want to probably have the kind of people who are just looking at with the wrong framework or who are just going to sell the moment I, I go down from 50% top line growth to 40% or 30%, right? So you need to have like, you know, if you think about all the great companies, uh, shareholder base is important. It gives I think one... they're probably learning that right now, right? Because yeah. they all IPO'd recently. They're not like Buffett that has been in the public right. market for 50 years. And they probably are learning that if you attract the Wall Street bets crowd or something, that's a problem because you're paying your employees in stock and you don't want your employees to be like all like depressed or something because they're looking at their RSUs going down yeah. and their, their stock options or you're having trouble hiring your great engineers because your stock keeps going down and they're like, oh, I don't want to go work for a sinking ship. You can create some a bunch of perceptions that don't stay in the public market. They end up having a real world effect on like hiring and retention and that kind of for stuff. Sure. I, I'm betting that they're like, I don't know, I, it may change how the messaging and that kind of stuff in the future. They're probably learning the public market uh, with a big trial by fire. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Hopefully they will come to the right framework in not so dis- distant future. I hope so. I think that's most of what I had. Did you have anything else to add on, on these two companies? No, I think we, we have, we, we are supposed to talk about only Cloudflare and uh, Datadog, but we ended up talking about probably the broader space too. A lot of these concerns, these are nothing, nothing unique concerns for, you know, these two companies. In some ways, these are more beta concerns for the broader software space, not necessarily idiosyncratic concerns. But yeah, and like I said, I think uh, there will probably be a couple of companies who will prove that these concerns are invalid for them. But yeah, so far to me, it just looks like it's going to be super hard for the whole software space in general to all have like 20, 30% gap EBIT margin, let's say. Oh, for sure. In five to seven years down the line. But I guess that's the job. I think, you know, in some sense, 
you and me probably shouldn't complain too much. I think that's the job, right? To figure out w- which companies end up uh, with those kind of margins. You know, if everyone ends up like, you know, 20, 20, 30 percent operating margin in five to seven years, then the job will be easy. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, everyone's so profitable, right? Uh, the nature of capitalism is, is very different. You know, the nature of capitalism dictates that most companies will not graduate to any level of compelling profitability, right? Yeah. So if software is a great business, well, great businesses attract lots of competition <laughs> and competition yeah. competes away margins and profits, right? So yeah. you need something in between <laughs> to keep the competition away. And so that's what people forgot, I think, in the past few years. People went from not understanding software, maybe like 10 years ago or something. Like I'm talking mm-hmm. people like in general, like there, there were always people who knew, but um, to... And, and then because software changed too, right? Because Microsoft was known to be a great business for a long time, but people were like, well, you know, they own the OS, they own the platform, there are not that many like that. Then people had to figure out the cloud, right? For a long time, AWS was totally misunderstood. Uh, and then over time, people started to get really excited about like all this SaaS and you know, cloud stuff. And I think it went way too far in painting the whole category with a broad brush and like all these, all these are going to be winners, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not that simple. But right. uh, I think that's why I like that, you know, we're not only looking at the income statement here, like we're talking about the products, the management, the cultures, the hiring, the R&D, the, the end markets, like understanding that kind of stuff, I think is where you're going to find that, okay, this company is different from this other one, right? They have the same gross margins and they have the same growth rates, but this one has probably a lot better chances of having good terminal value and stickiness and of creating new products and all that. Mm-hmm. And this other one, well, competition is going to come in and nothing's going to stop them from like a race to the bottom, right? So that's yeah. the part I like about investing. It's trying to you know, understand the systems level, how the machine works, not just like these numbers versus these numbers. <laughs> no, so true. It's true. I think the fact that it's so challenging makes it so much fun. That's a good place to end it. <laughs> Have a good day, my friend. Same to you. Take care. Bye-bye.